sort of include a little bit about that vision? Yes, no, uh, thank you very much um, for the invitation and just really enjoyed the previous remarks. I think what I'd like to do is I do want to talk about how we finance these programs. Like we have to uh, address the issue of the macroeconomics of these policies because at the end of the day, we want them to do what we ask them to do. And so I, um, I have been working a lot on the job guarantee, but my interest in, in, the, in the program is really um, to uh, rethink this program as an institutional vehicle for achieving certain socioeconomic objectives. And so I, I come to the table as a, as a friend of the basic income um, because we share so many goals. Um, I also come as a friendly critic of the basic income and a very particular basic income um, proposal um, just from the mo a point of view of, of my macroeconomic training and my uh, work on, on public financing. So the few main points that I, I, I want to make is, uh, are the following, that uh, the job guarantee actually ends up fulfilling the objectives that the basic income has, and the basic income, as defined in the literature, um, the pure uh, proposal actually has significant drawbacks and it doesn't uh, really um, provide income security. So I, that's the argument I want to run through. Now, I need to qualify this. I've been talking to friends from um, the basic income guarantee networks from academia for the last 15, 20 years, and we've been engaged in this dialogue. Um, and the, the issue is how do we, um, how do we um, eliminate economic insecurity, but also m my interest is how do we build a road to participation. So um, which is the model? What do we want from the basic income? Um, what is the program that we're going to envision? The program that I've been critical of is the one that is permanent, that is universal, that is unconditional, and that provides living standard income to anyone, rich or poor. Okay, so I'm literally talking about the program that will provide $20,000 a year to every citizen in the United States. I, you know, I sympathize with the motivation behind it, but I think the micro macroeconomics will work against the model. Um, okay, so uh, in, in part of my, my work, I study monetary systems. And um, um, one of the things that I'm interested in is uh, to talk about government spending by, by using the correct quote unquote paradigm. We can't buy into the neoliberal economic theory of governments being short of financial resources and they can't achieve uh, object, their objectives. Um, the, the very, very basic premise, and, and this alone is a whole topic of discussion <laughs> that is, you know, it takes a while to flesh out, but the very basic premise is that modern economies are fiat economies. They use fiat currencies. And in modern economies, the fiat currency is a public monopoly. It's a basic, simple public monopoly. So the very argument that the government cannot fund a policy priority doesn't make sense, even on the face of it. Whenever there's a policy priority, governments that have sovereign control over their own currencies always achieve them. We have institutions like the Treasury and the Fed that coordinate and make whatever is necessary um, uh, uh, to finance those programs. So in other words, financing for the government, which is the monopoly issuer of the currency, is never a problem. Okay. Now, you know, a lot of people are saying, what are you saying? You know, are you, are you just saying we roll on the printing presses and let's just spend, spend, spend? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the way government spends is spent in its own resource. Right? You and I have to earn the dollar. Uh, states have to you know, tax the dollar. The federal government does not. The federal government provides the dollar. So that alone you know, takes a while to sort of absorb and the implications of this. But um, we, we need to um, uh, you know, talk about federal funding and, and the proper, in the proper way. So the good news is um, that we can fund the programs. <laughs> right, that's the good news. The financing is not the question. The bad news is that we have a currency system that's a fiat currency system where we have to worry about what that currency can buy. What's the value of that currency? And so policy then has to think about how government provides that currency so that it doesn't erode its, its value. Okay, so the you know the simplest simplest way that I can um, I, I can I, I can explain this is that um, 
basic income, just the policy of sending everybody a check in the mail for $20,000, very easy policy, kind of like Social Security, right? It's very easy, but that alone provides money for nothing, right, in and of itself. And I know I don't want to use sort of the neoliberal, you know, frames that, you know, we don't value human life. I really don't mean that. What I mean is that normally currency is provided in exchange for real goods and services. And um, the, uh, the public, uh, public spending, in a sense, sets a conversion rate, if you will, between the, what the currency can buy and the stuff that is produced out there in the public and the private sector. Okay? So the, the basic distinction between these two policies is that in one instance, the money is quite literally free. In the other, it is in exchange for something. And what is that something? So that's where I'm, I'm very interested in, in talking about what do we want for that money, right? Um, the job guarantee, by, by providing a wage, you know, a, a $10 wage, let's say, um, you can say that, you know, um, every dollar is, what, six, six minutes of, of work or something like that, right? So in a sense, you are, you are situating the power of the currency in labor power. And I think that's, that's a powerful thing, that you are... Um, you know what your money is worth exactly of six minutes of socially useful work. And that's what the job, the job guarantee uh, connects these two things. All of, the, all of the objectives of the basic income guarantee, of the provisioning of the um, inadequate public resources and services, etc. the job guarantee can do that by anchoring the value in the currency in people. So I basically I have an, ar an article that makes the case that the pure, pure version of the basic income guarantee can be inflationary and potentially even hyperinflationary, which really is a disservice to precisely the people that we're trying to help. Part of the issue is opting out of the labor market, right? That's, that's uh, you know, one of the objectives. Um, but at the same time, the decommodification of labor is not a sufficient condition not even necessary, I think, um, for the erosion of, of, of capitalism. And we're still embedded in a capitalist system within which we have to buy things. And so what ends up happening is that, you know, many of us would opt out, but we will still, in one way or another, have to consume with that basic income. And uh, you could see how, um, without changing, the current power relations, production power relationships, you can, you can have firms simply uh, raise prices and uh, extract part of that basic income in the form of profit. So what I, so what I worry is that we, what we, so what would the basic income policy do? If there is a, if, there, if people are opting out, if supply is, is shrinking, but demand has increased because we all have now more purchasing power, right? That in and of itself should cause inflation. Okay. If, however, the employer has to coax people back into the labor market, right? All of these, you know, uh, fast food workers now are getting $20,000 a check. Why would they leave their kids, you know, and go to work instead of stay at home, right? So you could potentially have this mass exodus, which is what we want. But at the same time, you've reduced supply. So if the employer wants to coax them back into the labor market, you have to increase wages, which is a good thing. And maybe you have to increase wages and add benefits because, you know, you have to beat that $20,000 income, right? But then your hamburger is not going to be $3, it's going to be $30. So suddenly the income that we determined will give you your standard of living doesn't buy you the standard of living. Things are more expensive for rent, for food, and other stuff. So the basic income has not guaranteed you the minimum life. And we as policy, committed to this policy, have to increase the basic income. So now the basic income is 25, maybe $30,000. So now the $30,000 bad jobs are experiencing this process. So in a sense, it's doing what we wanted to do, like eliminate bad jobs and have firms kind of increase wages, but it's doing it by, in, by a mechanism that erodes the purchasing power of the basic income. So you can have like a constant vicious spiral um, um, that uh, is like a, you know, like a never ending catch up game. How do we deal with inflation in the modern world? Modern economies keep unemployment. They use unemployment to fight inflation. Essentially, they reduce people's income, they keep them hungry so they can't buy the stuff. Okay? 
Now, we don't want that. And what unemployment does is a counter-cyclical problem. When, when there is inflationary pressures, right, we, lot of, we lay off a lot of people. When there are deflationary pressures, you know, we, we try to hire people, or we give them unemployment insurance, right, just to keep them alive, right? So there is a counter-cyclical spending mechanism that tames inflation. The job guarantee has this virtue that that's the counter-cyclical spending that when the economy is not doing well and people have lost even their good private sector jobs, they go in the public sector program where they get that income, but they are producing um, socially useful output. So I'll get to the point, to that point. So when the economy is shrinking, the job guarantee is expanding. When the economy is expanding, the job guarantee could be shrinking because people are moving to better paid jobs as the private sector demands those, those people. So you have a counter-cyclical mechanism, taming mechanism of inflation that is, does not exist in the basic income. So I don't want to be too, like, you know, too technical into that stuff, but I think that this, these two aspects are quite important in the way these programs function. So to me, uh, it, is, it is not at all a problem for us to marry the two proposals where we can say, here is an institution that values labor, that values social useful work, environmentally friendly um, jobs, and here's a program that puts the social motive ahead of the profit motive. And we will guarantee you a living income for that job. Are you ready and willing to work? Would you like income for the public purpose? Here it is. I recognize that not everybody can participate in, in, the, in this program, and there has to be some sort of income support for people for one reason or another cannot participate. And we may value those kinds of activities. Policy could explicitly state, okay, we want to support stay-at-home moms, and therefore we will provide unconditional income. They don't have to come and earn right, their wage, in a sense. So we, could, we can recognize that certain um, uh, groups of people will not want to work or should not work and um, uh, complement the employment program or the income from social useful work with income um, that is uh, guaranteed. So basically, I just want to, um, I mean, there are a lot of things that I, I, I want us to discuss here, but I do see J job guarantee as that institution. It's that vehicle that brings people together. It is that vehicle that is attempting to fill social need, to begin building what is a very eroded social fabric in the United States, quite frankly, right? There are so many things that need to be done, and there are so many people that, that, that uh, can do them. And so the job guarantee is the coordinating mechanism. Um, it also recognizes work versus leisure. It kind of sets the standard of what a good job is. And the private sector has to match the pay package, the leisure, the, the vacation package. Um, and the same dynamic we, we then get to experience with private sectors meeting um, or rather losing their workers from bad jobs because there is a public option of a good job. Um, and finally, um, I just want to emphasize that uh, last point is that you have to change property rights. If you want to, if, if that's the issue, if the issue is capitalism, like it, you have to change property rights. You, it's not just allowing people not to work is not going to do anything if property rights are not changed. Capital is consolidated, it's concentrated, power, market power has been determined. I, I think that people would be marginalized if, um, um, uh, if, if there aren't other enormous reforms to undermine capitalism. That's the goal. But the, pay, the job guarantee can create wealth and assets for people. You can use your cooperatives, you can use whatever other arrangements to create wealth. Um, and I'll stop here. Thank Great. you.